Mary when uh, Laura McBee says, what's all this sticky stuff on the pews? I'm blaming you. It wasn't me. Uh-oh. Might be doing this uh, without my notes, I guess. I bet I can still get through it. Yeah, I might be doing it without. Oh, hey, there it is. All right. So, uh, one of the things that I've always, the last 10 years or so, I've always looked at is Christian unity and what causes all these divisions that we have today. We look at the denominational differences. We look at, we have Baptists and Methodists and we have Christian and Disciples of Christ. Even within our own tradition, we have Disciples of Christ, independent Christian churches and churches of Christ. And we, we see all these divisions. And the question becomes, what causes these divisions? Really, there's probably a lot of things we could talk about. We could talk about pride. We could talk about tradition. We could talk about all those things. But I think ultimately, most of the time, what it boils down to is this. What is this, and how do we understand it? I think ultimately, that is what causes most of the divisions that we have. We can read a passage in Scripture... Now, I can understand it one way, and you might understand it another way, and you might understand it yet another way. Because we are interpreting God's Word, and we are coming to different conclusions. Now, I have a high view of Scripture. This is the infallible, inerrant Word of God. Make no mistake. What happens, though, is when we get to reading it, we have all these other influences in our lives, and we struggle with it. And I think that's what has caused many of the divisions that we have. But you know, reading a passage and coming to different conclusions, or at least talking about a passage and interpreting it in a different way, is nothing new. In fact, we're going to look today at James and the Apostle Paul, and how they interpret a passage of the Old Testament. And we're going to talk about their conclusions and how maybe it's different than others, but also maybe how there's some similarities. Because if this is the inerrant, infallible Word of God, they can't be in conflict with each other necessarily. There might be some tension, they might talk about things differently, but this is scripture we're talking about. And so how do we understand it? And so we're going to start off this morning looking at the passage that they both use to prove their point. And so that comes way back in the book of Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15, we're going to just start in verse 1. But I want to tell you what's happened here. Abraham, he's a, he's a guy and he's out living with his family. Everything's going well. And guess what? God speaks to him and says, Abraham, leave your family, leave your father's household, leave your possessions behind. Go to this land where I will show you at a later date and I will bless you. And Abraham does it. Okay? Well... Years later, he's still waiting for God to bless him. And he's especially waiting for a child to be born, a son, somebody to take heir or ownership of what Abraham has. And he doesn't have it. And it starts to frustrate Abraham a little bit. You can kind of tell that. And uh, there's probably some external pressure on him, even by Sarah, his wife. Sarah's probably going, hey, honey, you said if we left everything behind and we followed you, we'd get a son. I'm almost 90 years old. When's this son going to come? So Abraham's probably feeling some of that family pressure as well. Well, here's what happens in chapter 15 of Genesis. The word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. 
Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abraham said, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate, my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abraham continued, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. But then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. And so God took him outside and said, Look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. And then he said to Abram, So shall your offspring be. Now, I want to stop right there for just a moment. And so that's what happens. Abraham, he's wanting the son so badly that God has promised him it's not coming. Abraham's starting to doubt what's going to happen. I'm getting old. Sarah's getting old. And God takes him outside and says, Abraham, you not only are you going to have one son, look up at the stars. That's how many sons you're going to have. That's how many descendants you are going to have. And so what does Abraham do? Well, we have verse 6 here we're going to read. And verse 6 might be one of the most controversial verses in all of Scripture. Abraham believed the Lord and God credited it to him as righteousness. You will have descendants as numerous as, as the stars. And Abraham believed him. But you see, verse 6 is actually... The verse that Paul and James both use in different ways. They understand it or they put an emphasis on one thing and not the other. Verse 6 again reads, Abram believed the Lord and he, God, credited to him as righteousness. And so let's start with the Apostle Paul. How does the Apostle Paul use this verse. Well, he uses it in the book of Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. And we're going to read verses 1 through 5. And so the Apostle Paul at this point in Romans, he has been laboring the point that we are all sinners. We are not saved by the law or obedience to the law. We are saved by faith. Having our faith placed in Christ and Christ's death on the cross is what saves humanity from their sins. And so the Apostle Paul has been laboring this point and he gets to chapter 4 and he decides he's going to use an example. Verse 4, chapter 4, verse 1. What then shall we say of Abraham, our forefather? What did he discover in this matter? If in fact Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. What does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to a man who does not work, but trusts God, but trusts the God who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. And so we saw there, Paul has used this verse in Genesis 15, 6. But let's go on because it talks more about it in verse 9. Is this blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? You know, we have been saving, saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it before he was circumcised or after? It was not after, but before. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then he is the father of all who believe but have not been circumcised in order that the righteousness might be credited to them. 
And he is also the father of the circumcised, who not only are circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. And so we see here where Paul uses it and says we are not justified by our works. We are not saved by our good works. Abraham wasn't even circumcised yet. And remember, to a Jewish audience, circumcision is pretty important. That's the sign of the covenant. And yet he has been given this blessing without circumcision. And so Paul uses this verse and says, see, he believed. It's not talking about his works. And Protestants, remember Protestants, you have two major divisions in uh, Christians, Christianity. You have Catholics and you have Protestants. Well, Protestants read this and they start celebrating and they say, yes, see, we are saved by faith, not our works. We can live however we want as long as we believe in God. That's what it says. And so Protestants take that and say, yes. But then you have people on the other side and they go, well, wait a second. Why are you prioritizing Paul? What does James say about it? And so let's see what James says about it. Because guess what? He uses Genesis 15, 6 as well. So if you would, let's turn to James chapter 2. We read this verse last week, actually. But let's turn to James chapter 2. Starting in verse 20. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham who considered righteousness for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. Well, there you have it. You've heard from Paul. You've heard from James. And they seem to come into conflict with one another. What do we do if we say this is the inerrant, infallible Word of God? Now, I'm going to be honest. What some people do is they say, well, that's why we don't say it's the inerrant, infallible Word of God. We say it's a witness to God's work. It's a witness to it. It's not the Word of God. I don't buy it. It's the Word of God. Okay. And so how do we do it? Most of the time in Protestantism, what we do is we do prioritize Paul. We say Paul was that lead apostle. He wrote 13 books. Let James only wrote one. Okay, that's usually what we come up to do. But I think there's a better way of doing this. And the better way to do it is probably to understand Paul a little bit better. You see, sometime... In church history, probably semi-recently, within the last 500 years or so, uh, we have decided that faith is a noun, but it does not necessarily have to relate to the word faithful, which is an adjective. Paul would have never seen that distinction. If you have faith, you will be faithful. He doesn't make that distinction like so many of us do today. You want me to prove it? I will. In the book of Romans, we're going to stay in Romans. You see, we looked at that first part of Romans, but in chapter 12, Paul makes a transition. Paul makes a transition. The first part of this uh, book is primarily dealing with Paul's theology, and starting in verse 12, he turns it into a lot more practical advice. What does it look like on a day, uh, when you live out daily what he has said in the first 11 chapters? And so in Romans chapter 12, he says this, starting in verse 1 again. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy... 
to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. And from there... Paul starts talking about how you live out this faith, what this faith looks like. But what did he say there? To offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, as holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. How do you worship God? It is your daily life that you make your body a living sacrifice. And by doing it, guess what happens? You will be able to approve what God's will is. You can figure out what God's will is by your spiritual act of worship. And so Paul goes on, and let's read a little bit more of chapter 12. Let's look at verse 6. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophecy, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it's teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let, get, let him give generously. If it's to leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is to showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. You see, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, Lo honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need and practice hospitality. Now he goes on and he starts listing other things as well. Verse 17, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful not to do, be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible as far as it depends on you live at peace with everyone. And then he goes on and he even quotes the Old Testament and here's what he says here in verse 20. If your enemy is hungry, Feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And Paul goes on in chapter 13, and he continues this idea of Christian living, how you submit to government authorities is in chapter 13. It talks about loving one another. It talks about when you're in conflict with one another and you have a weak and a strong brother is what he talks about. How you are to get through that. But as we read Paul, let us never think he is talking about faith by itself. He is linking faith to being faithful with who you serve. He is linking those two together. That is how you live your life. And last week we looked at James, and James is saying the same thing, right? James says, let us live our lives faithfully and this is how you do it. You do it by your good works and so on and so forth. You do it by controlling your tongue. You do it by caring for the poor. And James goes on and on about that. You see, because James and Paul, they're not in conflict with one another. They might have a different emphasis for using that Genesis 15, 6 passage. For Paul, he is using it to talk about that moment in time you are found innocent in the sight of God when you are justified for that first time when God's grace is given to you. That is what he is emphasizing there. But James, he's talking to people that are Christians and he's not talking about that moment you are found innocent in the sight of God. He is talking about what do you do with it because you are found innocent in the sight of God. Because God knows all things. God has foreknowledge. He knows how you're going to act. And so when you say, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, when you say that, He knows if your heart is sincere or not. He knows if your heart is being transformed or not. 
And if it is being transformed, if you are sincere, your life will naturally be faithful to God the Creator, God the Redeemer. And so, if somebody ever comes to you and they say, Scripture conflicts with itself, or Paul and James are in conflict with themselves, say, no, it's not. Let's actually read the passages and see what it has to say. And let us never forget, our faith cannot be disconnected from being faithful to who we have faith in. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, thank you for this day and all the blessings you've given us. Lord God, I thank you for Paul, and I thank you for James, I thank you for Abraham, and I thank you for this conversation we're having today where we can take assurance knowing that if we put our faith in you, yes, we will be secured eternally. That's what Paul's talking about. But Lord God, if we truly put our faith in you, and it is a saving faith, it is a faith that our hearts are truly being transformed, we know our lives will be faithful to you for the remainder of our lives. Lord God, be with us as we go throughout the remainder of our lives and let us focus on you and continue to be faithful to you in how we live our lives so every aspect of our life is worship to you as we are living sacrifices to you. In Christ we pray. Amen.